we were looking at the theme of make us one, looking at unity, unity from the heart of God and the call of God in our lives. And as we've studied make us one, these are a few just quick thoughts that we've looked at. Unity begins in the presence of God. We need the presence of God. And unity is a huge deal to God. Unity is not one of those things that the Lord looks at and says, you know what, uh, I, I want you to come and what's most important to me uh, is the way you look and making sure you know the right things to say. You know what, the Lord says, you want to know how to please my heart? Walk in unity because there I'm going to command a blessing. There I will bless. When people walk together in unity, the Lord says, I will bless you there. I'll bless you in unity. So we know it's what God wants. We know in Scripture it's the measure of our salvation very often. Unity is our witness to the world, and it is what the world needs. Unity is what the world needs. This morning, we're going to jump into a few more thoughts, and as we look at this, uh, just follow with me here this morning. I'm uh, just going to share just the thoughts that the Lord's put on my heart. Again, I'm pulling from a book by Francis Chan called Until Unity. I recommend it to you. It's good stuff, okay? So unity, are you ready? It starts with repentance. It starts with repentance. Somebody say that with me. It starts with repentance. Unity starts with repentance. How often have you looked around and said, if that person would just get their brain straight, we could walk in unity. Have you ever, I know, not, not that you've ever thought that, but I'm sure somebody you know has thought that. If that person would stop showing out and get their mind straight and get their heart straight, if they would start thinking like me, we could walk in unity. That's the way we think very often. But you'll find that the more scripture that you study, and the more you bring yourself under the authority of Almighty God, you will learn that we individually are the ones that have plenty of work to do. And do not assume that the disunity and the division that you feel is somebody else's fault. Because guess what? You have a part to play. And the Word of God doesn't say, correct your brother and all will be unified. The Lord tells us in his scripture, hey, you repent. Get your heart right in front of me. That's where unity will begin. Unity will begin with repentance. In fact, revival begins with repentance. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. There we go. It says this, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So my prayer today, even as we begin, we're on a path to unity. It's an invitation from the heart of God for us for these weeks. The Lord's inviting us to walk in unity. And when he does that, he says, I want to tell you where to begin. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Charles Finney, the great revivalist, made these statements about revival, and I'm going to paraphrase his writing and what he said. He said, we, we have made revival this strange, mystic thing that you can't really predict, and you don't know where it's going to land, and it's almost as if God is just randomly out there just saying, you know what, I like that church, revival to them. I like that one over there, revival to them. Their logo's pretty cool, revival to them. I like their singing over that revival to them, but I'm not going to revive anybody else. Do you know what? The word of God is so clear, and Charles Finney points this out, that renewal and revival will begin anywhere the people of God will begin to call on God and repent and turn from their wicked ways. The Lord says, there I will do my work. There I will begin to revive. There I will renew. There I will rescue. There I'll do a work that nobody else can do. It's not this strange mystic thing where the Lord says, maybe you and maybe you. The Lord says, I'm waiting on somebody to call on me. And my word is my word is my word is my word. And what I said I meant and whoever stands on what I said, what will follow is life and revival. So we don't have to look around and say, 
oh, would it happen to Asbury? Why is it not happening here? You know what? At that moment, you've lost the very heart of what the Lord wants to do. The Lord says, stop looking around. Why don't you stand on my word and walk in repentance and watch the revival that begins right in the middle of where you are. Watch the renewal that begins. We should pay attention to the pattern that if we are spending our time together repenting, worshiping, and confessing, if we spend our time worshiping, repenting, and confessing, it leaves little time for disunity. Have you ever been with somebody and they spent some serious time in the presence of God confessing their sin? I mean confession. I mean hardcore. I'm going to get it right with God. And I'm going to get on my face and I'm going to repent. God, forgive me. God, forgive me. God, forgive me. God, forgive me. Oh, God, thank you that you're merciful. Oh, God, thank you that you help me. God, thank you that you cleanse me. Thank you, God, that I in my sin need you so desperately. Thank you that you come and cleanse me. Have you ever known somebody to get up from a position like that and go out and turn and be ugly to people? I have not. Because when we get our hearts right before God, what ends up emerging from us is unity with the brothers and sisters in Christ. And if I end up running into somebody that I think is not right, I don't look at them and say, if you'll get right, we can walk in unity. I say, oh, Lord, help me. God, help me. Help me get my heart right. Help me get my heart right. Sometimes, see if I can even say this right. See if I can make sure and word this correctly. Sometimes the people that God has put in your life, he is not put there for you to correct them. He has put them there for you to see how much you need to be corrected. Amen. Woo. Yeah. Some, sometimes that one that just like, oh, 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 oh. God fix them. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for getting them away from me. Thank you, God, for getting them away from me. Thank you, God, for removing them. Get them out of here, God. Get them out of, whoa, hallelujah. Get them out of here. Get them away. You know what the Lord says? Stop that. Why don't you ask me what I want to do in you because they're near you? Humility comes out in our lives. We walk like that. I wonder how our disunity actually looks to God. How does our disunity actually look to God? I'm going to say, out of Isaiah 55, follow me through this, our disunity most often looks very silly to God Almighty. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, let me read these verses to you. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So the Lord says to us today, before you start anything out, you need to know your position in relation to my perfection. As high as the heavens are above the earth, that's how much greater I am than you are, says the Lord. And he's not doing that just to make you feel small. The Lord is saying that to remind us that in fact we are small. And we need him. Got me a friend up here. If you, can't, if you can't see, there's a fly that's having fun right now. I'll kill him before the service is over. Hallelujah. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's do a quick comparison. I'm going to borrow three guys here on the front. Andrew, Robbie. Uh, let's see. Ron, come on up here. You three men. I, I need... They're they're going to be my illustration this morning. Okay, Um, we're going to look at how our disunity looks to God. All right, so let's just talk about these gentlemen are walking and they're trying to decide who is the most theologically accurate. Okay, let's just say that for example. All right, Robbie just, Robbie's the most theologically accurate. Uh, Okay, which, okay, so that's pride. So Andrew, you get to go to the top. All right, uh, let's, let's put, okay, right there, stand right there. All right, then. Robbie and Ron, y'all can fight over who's next. The next person goes here. There you go. Come on. Come on, Ron. You'll go, you'll go right there. There you go. And Robbie, because of that humility, allowing him, Ron, step down one. 
I'm just playing. Now, Robbie, you go right there. Okay, so this is what, what they've done. All right. And so what they're doing is they're, they've argued over who is the, <laughs> the, most, the most correct. Okay. Now, so they're arguing over that. And if you'll notice, there are six-inch differences between them. All right, but the, but the scope of where God is in his perfection is the heavens above the earth, right? All right, so let's just take, for example, let's just use the moon as an example. The moon is 240,000 miles away from the earth right now. That's not even the heavens. That's not even the heavens. So if I'm getting my perspective right, all right, let's just say that I'm up here too, and I'm the, I'm, my theology is the most incorrect of all up here. All right. What, what's so funny is we start looking at our people around us and we say, I, how are you six inches better than me? Or we look and we say, I'm six inches better than you. I'm six inches better than you. <laughs> My theology is right. I'm exactly right. I've got it all figured out. I'm six inches better than you. And the Lord says, I don't care how you look compared to each other. The scale that I've called you to view these things on is the heavens above the earth. That's how much greater I am than you. And so what we would do better to do is say, Lord, what we recognize is you are 240,000 miles up above the earth. So rather than looking at my men, the men and women around me and trying to figure out who the most right is and who the most justified is, the Lord said, get your eyes on me. The scale is 240,000 miles. Yet we argue over six inches, don't we? We argue over six inches and we, we say, I'm right, you're wrong. I'm right, you're wrong. And the Lord says, stop looking at each other. Get your eyes on me. I am 240,000 miles above you. What's required is your repentance, not your comparison. What's needed is your humility and not you looking around saying how you were six inches better than that next person. All of you are 240,000 miles away from right. It brings unity. It brings humility. Amen. Thank you, man. It brings, it brings humility, and if we actually get the right view of God, if we get the right view of God, it makes unity flow in the body. Because then I'm not looking and saying, I'm six inches better than you. <laughs> the Lord says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, that's how much higher I am than you are. Stop looking and comparing. Fix your eyes on the heavens. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And based on the scripture, it's more than 240,000 miles, Jesus says. The Lord God says in Isaiah, as high as the heavens are above the earth, that's how much greater his ways are than our ways. Isaiah 55 is true. So maybe, we, maybe the better policy in our lives would be to focus on repentance in our own hearts. Repentance and humility work hand in hand. Humility is found... In the presence, a healthy view. Walking in humility is found in a healthy view of the presence and the holiness of God Almighty. That's when our hearts are set right. If we get a view of Him, then we walk right in relation to brothers and sisters. If I get a healthy view of God Almighty, I'm going to walk correctly in relation to men and women around me. Follow me through this. If we'll get a healthy view of God Almighty, we will realize how our racism and our prejudice and the dark junk in our hearts doesn't look like him at all. Get a healthy view of God, and I'll look around, and I'm going to say, hallelujah, these men and women were made by God all around me, and we're going to gather there before his throne on that day. You know what? When I get a healthy view of God, the junk in my life requires repentance, and I line up with him. And all of a sudden, I can walk in unity be between men and women. I can walk in unity because I'm not comparing anymore. I'm looking at God Almighty. Repentance and humility is found in a healthy view of the presence of God. Philippians 2 teaches us, I'm going to just paraphrase. Philippians 2 teaches us that we are to be like Christ. And if you read Philippians 2, verses 1 through 13, let me just read it to you. It's really good. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, 
being in one spirit and of one mind, one spirit, one mind, hallelujah, do not do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. It continues, therefore, dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to fulfill to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. All right, we'll stop right there. But what Paul is saying is walk in humility, walk in humility, and God will make you one. Walk in humility, just like Jesus walked in humility, and under the work of Christ and through the work of Christ, you'll be made one, and his salvation will be worked out in the middle of the fellowship. His salvation will be worked out. In many ways, in many ways, we've lost the sense of true holiness and the greatness of our God. And when we lose that awareness, it allows pride to grow and simmer in the church and in our hearts. Without a proper fear of God, we all start out with the assumption that, that, that our own opinion is right, rather than recognizing that all of us have an incomplete, flawed knowledge of God. We need humility before the presence of Almighty God. So our prayer today is, Lord, remove our pride. Remove our pride. Without humility, we will never be able to walk in relationship with one another. Without humility, we can never walk in a right relationship with God Almighty. So our prayer today is, Lord, restore an awareness of your holiness in our lives. Lord, restore an awareness of our need for the fear of God. Give us a healthy fear of God. Give me a healthy fear of God that when I walk, I walk aware that you are holy and you are higher than I am. Are you brave enough to pray that with me today? I know that you are. Would you even just say right now, Lord, restore to me the fear of God. Restore to me the fear of God. Pray it. Spend just a moment with him. Restore to me, Lord, the fear of God. That I can walk in humility. Restore to me the fear of God. My prayer today is, Lord, may humility mark our church. May humility mark our church. May humility mark this fellowship in the name of Jesus. I, I like that because Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want the kingdom of heaven. Lord, let humility mark this place in the name of Jesus so that the kingdom of heaven may flow. We've looked at this. There's a slide that you have, uh, media team. Uh, it was the last slide that was given to you. If you could pull that up, it's got a progression on there. Here we go. Thank you. This is the way it works as a house of prayer. This is our, this is our prayer. Extended time in God's presence, us becoming a house of prayer, brings humility in our lives. And when you get a clear view of God in prayer, humility is how you emerge from that prayer time. Humility. And so the more time we have in God's presence, the more humility will mark us. Why do we need to be a house of prayer? For, well, other than the other one million reasons, we need humility before the presence of God in one another. Humility. But out of humility, when we walk in humility, all of a sudden, a special God-given unity begins to emerge in the body and in the fellowship. And out of that unity comes community. 
and a, a God-given community. And as Doug Small said, it is that community that is the nest where God loves to place his glory as we read about in Psalm 133. For there the Lord commands a blessing, life forevermore. So you know what? Let's keep on going as a house of prayer. Let's keep on crying out to the Lord because I see down the path from being a house of prayer. Time in God's presence is going to give you humility. If you ever talk to somebody and they say, I've been spending time in God's presence, and they're walking around as proud as a peacock, something's not right. Something's not right. There's danger there somewhere. There's danger. Because when I've encountered people that have spent time in God's presence, they've, they've had time like Jacob who became Israel where all of a sudden their name has been changed. They walk with humility. In fact, they walk with a limp and their ego has been broken for the glory of God. So Lord, extended time in your presence will bring humility. And humility will flow into unity. And that will create a community of worshipers. And there the Lord says, I command my blessing, life forevermore. So the next thing that we look at this morning is this. Unity comes with maturity. Unity comes with maturity. I got to move fast. I want to talk to you for just a moment about Christian maturity. Because Christian maturity is something that we all know that we need but so often we fail to make it the whole way to Christian maturity. And unity will come in full measure when we're walking as maturing brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians that our immaturity is seen in our divisions. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul confronts the church in Corinth and he says, Guys, I don't quite understand. Some of you say you're for Paul. Others say you're for Apollos. Others say... You're for Cephas, uh, I, I don't understand. And then Paul says, hang on, is Christ divided? Should there be divisions among you? Then he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, when you're walking around divided, you are no different than the world. And it means that you're carnal and you're not mature in the Lord. So when we walk around in division, the Lord God looks at us and he says, you are not mature. That is carnality, that's the flesh, and you're acting just like mere men. It's what he says in Corinthians. You're acting like a bunch of men, a bunch of flesh. And he doesn't mean that in a good way. He says you're acting like mere men rather than the children of the Most High. I, I, I copied this out of the words of Francis Chan. Listen to this as I read it to you. He says, so often when we gather these days, we talk about churches and worship bands and schools, theologians and books and songs and denominations and ministries. We talk about political issues, social issues, pastors, singers, etc. Inevitably, disagreements will rise about who is the most accurate, the most anointed, the most intelligent, and the most wise. And once you pick your favorite leader, you, we, we head to the island where everyone worships that favorite leader. And there on that island where everyone worships our favorite leader, suddenly you feel unity again because you've surrounded yourselves with people who agree with you regarding your leader or on your theology. You all agree on your own strengths and you agree on the weaknesses of others. Basically, you, you find the island where everybody thinks like you and you agree that everybody else is wrong. And as long as you and others stay on your island, there is harmony. But what we understand is that is not Christian unity. That is not Christian unity. That is placing ourselves inside of our echo chamber Social media is very much an echo chamber, and by echo chamber, it's the whole concept of you, you surround yourselves on social media. We all do. We've all done this. We surround ourselves on social media with people that think like us. And so if I say something angry, in my echo chamber, angry people are going to echo back exactly what I just said. And it gets louder, and the sound gets louder, and it's my anger, and it's my, it's my, uh, it's, 
Well, I have a fit. I'm having a fit on social media and other people are having a fit with me. Oh, we are so unified. You know what? That's because you've created that little world. And it's an echo chamber. And, and what, we have, what we've failed to understand is that often even the mentality that we carry in those places is, is, is not uh, leaning towards mature Christian unity. Nor is it leaning toward being a light to the broken world because of the love of Jesus who died for every man, woman, boy, and girl on the face of this planet. What if we started changing the tune at Christian Life International Church? What, what if, rather than boasting about our favorite leader or our favorite denomination, or our favorite this or that. What if we did something that Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, let anyone that boasts, let them boast in the Lord God Almighty. Let them boast in the Lord God. What if we started changing the tune around here? And rather than saying, that's my favorite one over there, that's my favorite one over there, that's my favorite one over there, uh, I like that one the most and that one the most. What if we changed our tune and we said, out of the mouths of this church, the only bragging that's going to happen out of our mouths is bragging on the Lord God Almighty. And let them that boast in this place, let us boast in the Lord. If we will use our voices and our mouths and our breath to begin to boast in the Lord, it will bring a sense of unity that will go beyond the divisions of this busted up world. It will go beyond the divisions of our flesh and our selfishness and our pride and our conceit. If we will boast in the Lord, we will find a greater unity than we've ever known. So how many of you, you're going to brag on God with me from now until the day you die? Let it be from this place. Amen. Hey, let it be from this place that... Let, don't, don't you dare, don't let, let's, let's not dare walk out of this place and say, glory to God, Christian Life International. Or you might walk out of this place and say, glory to God, that other place is better than Christian Life International. You know what? I don't care. I don't care. What if we said the tune from this place is going to be, you know what? We boast in the Lord God Almighty. He is setting people free. He is working. He is moving. He's bringing glory to his name right now in this generation. We're going to brag on God. We're going to brag on God. We're going to brag on God. Out of our mouths is going to come boasting and it's going to be glorifying the Lord with our voices. Turn to your neighbor right now and I want you just 10 seconds. Brag on God about something he's done even this week. Brag on God. Brag on God. Do it. And you can do it loud. Uh, you're being quiet. Do it loud. Brag on God. What, if, what do you think would happen if we stopped talking about ourselves and we started bragging on God more? Amen. Well, I don't know. I've never done that. Maybe we haven't. Let's try it. Let's try it. Let's stop talking about ourselves. Let's spend our days bragging and boasting about the goodness of God. Too often we fixate on disagreements. Francis Chan wrote this. I love this. Too often we fixate on disagreements. We feel like we can't worship with such big elephants in the room. We fail to realize that God is infinitely bigger than our elephants. Hallelujah. And Francis Chan writes, He is worthy of our praise and our attention. Even if you sit in a herd of elephants, God is worthy of praise. I can't worship because of the elephant in the room. God's bigger than that elephant. I can't worship because of all the awkwardness. God's bigger than the awkwardness. God's bigger than a room full of awkwardness. Christian maturity is when we come to look like Jesus. Ephesians 4, we don't have time to read it today. I want to move on ahead. When we are mature in Christ, we grow together as one. We become like him. So Christian maturity is seen in a body of believers as they grow in love for one another. I've got a few more scripture I'm going to read to you. Let's go to 2 Peter 1, please. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, 
knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. We add love. How about Galatians 5? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Colossians 3, how about this scripture regarding unity? Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Amen. Love binds us together in perfect unity. Love binds us together in perfect unity. There are a couple of flaws uh, in our path to maturity. One of the flaws that we have created is we have made Christian discipleship synonymous with gathering information. We have made Christian discipleship synonymous with gathering information, and this is how this looks. We think if we have come and we have said, Lord, I give my life to you, we think then that there are a number of classes that we can take. I can take that class and that class and that class and that class and that class. I can read that book, that book, that book, that book, I gather information, I gather information. But it doesn't require that I walk in relationship, nor does it require that I actually be sweet to people. I gather information, and I think that that's Christian maturity. And based on the word of God, I need you to hear this. It is not maturity when you've got a bunch of head knowledge, but you don't know how to walk with brothers and sisters in love. That is not maturity. That is, that is a sidetrack we've created where we think that information is our savior. Information is not your savior. Now to grow in the good things of God and the knowledge of God Almighty, yes, that is good. But Christian maturity comes when I have to bang that stuff out for the glory of God between men and women. Because the greatest commandments, Jesus said, love God and love people. He doesn't say love God and then love his information. He says love God and love people. Christian maturity is when we push beyond just that gathering info we love info because it makes us feel better and it creates a pride inside of us then I'm like "Woo! I am so smart Mm, 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 mm. I am a mature Christian Mm, 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 mm. because I've read all of Francis Chan's books and I I almost have almost have uh, 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 uh. or Jack Hayford's books or uh, 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 uh. and I'm, I'm good man I got it and the Lord says That is not maturity. you got a bunch of info in your head, but you don't know how to walk with men and women for the glory of God. Christian maturity is when we learn to walk with men and women for the glory of God in relationship. The second flaw that we've created on the way to Christian maturity, and Francis Chan brings this up, and it's it's really good. Speaking of Francis Chan, uh, it's another fatal flaw, and it's how we've built the modern church experience. We have done things in the modern church and we have built the modern church in such a way that we have often gathered around other things other than the love of Christ and the work of Christ. And we've done it this way. We have said whatever it takes to get people in the door, we're going to get people in the door. Whatever it takes. And if we get, and and just follow me through this thought, if we can get the show good, Then we'll get people showing up and we'll do whatever we can to get them to come back. And what often that has done is we have then reduced Christian maturity to the lowest common denominator and we've tried to make it a pretty show. So we keep getting people to come back and we work it just right to get them to come back. But the call is not to grow up in Christ. We're not gathering around the work of Jesus. We're gathering around a modern show. And in the middle of that body of, 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 of attendees, it will be difficult to find Christian unity because we built the church in ways that Jesus never built his believers we've done things to get a crowd Jesus said things that were right and holy and godly and he spread out the crowd 
We, we've built it in such a way so that we get people that just want their ears tickled. And the Lord said, I, I, I didn't do that. If you want to follow me, uh, deny yourself. Take up your cross and come after me. Because if you lose your life, then you'll find it. See, that's the message that we don't often present because that doesn't bring the, the masses in. But the Lord says, if my people together, if you'll walk in love and in unity and let the cross of Jesus be the center and the focus of everything, I'll build a family of believers I will build a fellowship where the kingdom of God will flow and when you see crowds come it will be because the glory of God has drawn them and the mercy of Christ has drawn them and when we gather together around the glory of Christ and we are coming and we're building the way that Jesus excuse me we let Jesus build his church in this place and unity begins to flow then the Lord says I command my blessing there now the draw to that fellowship is not going to be a good show. It will be the mighty love of God poured out because of the Holy Spirit working in their midst. May that be what the Lord does. The last thing that we read about Christian unity that we're going to speak on today is this. It thrives with love. It thrives with love. Our unity thrives with on love. Let's see if I can say this quickly and without any, any shadow. Love is the mark of Christian maturity. Loving one another is the mark of Christian maturity. The pinnacle, the pinnacle of walking in Jesus isn't some, isn't some, uh, we almost get this, uh, we almost get this picture where if, if I gather enough information, there is a level of holiness I will attain that will be far above other people. I'm on my way there, and when I get there, I don't really have to be nice to people because I'll be holy. I don't really have to reach out because I know God so much better than other people. We become Pharisees is what we become. And the Lord Jesus reminds us in his words that the pinnacle of following him the pinnacle, the highest spot, the place where his kingdom flows and he works and he moves. The place where God moves is when God's people walk in love. Love. Well, pastor, that sounds, that sounds so simple. That sounds so simple. Yes. That's why we miss it over and over and over and over and over and over again. Let the love of Christ pour in this place. Let the love of Christ pour out of hearts and, and to others in this place. Let the love of Christ pour out of this place and down into the valley. Let the love of Christ pour out of our lives. Love is the pinnacle of what the Lord wants to do. John 13, 34 and 35. I'm going to share this with you, tell you a quick story, and then we're going to pray together. A new command I give you, love one another. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Again, Jesus didn't say, by this, all men will know you're my disciples when you are the smartest ones in the bunch. When you're the most intelligent. When you're the most anointed. People will know when, when the show gets really good. No, he says, if you'll love one another, the world will stand up and say, now that's different. That is different. Come on, Roosevelt. Amen, sir. I hear you back there. Come on. Love one another, said Jesus. Love one another. By this the world will know that you're my disciples if you love each other. I love Pastor Jack Hayford. He's going to be with Jesus now. And he was a very dear man. And God used him very, very instrumentally in my life uh, at, at some very key moments. The story that he shares, and I love this, it was in a meeting that I was in with some pastors and he was teaching this group of pastors. And he talked about a, a time when he was praying for the power of God to flow in their church. He wanted the power of God to flow in their church. And Pastor Jack talks about it was a morning and the sun was just coming up and he went to his daily prayer time at, a, at an old cloth recliner is what he described. And he said he knelt down there in front of that old cloth recliner and he said he started praying some good, fervent, uh, Pentecostal kinds of prayers, you know. And he, oh God, send your power. Oh God, send your power. Oh God, send your power. Pastor Jack talks about how he, would, he was hitting the chair. 
praying. Oh, God, send your power. Send your power, God. Send your power, God. Send your power. And he said he, he cried out until he was exhausted. And then he opened his eyes and dust had come off that old recliner. It was all in the air. That's what he describes. He says there was a bunch of dust in the air. And just in the quietness of that moment, he heard the Holy Spirit say, My power is in my love. My power is in my love. Christian Life International, do you want to see the power of God flow? I do. Do you need the power of God in your family? I do. Do you need the power of God working in generational bondages? Yes, I do. Yes, do we, do we want to see the power of God set people free and heal and deliver and rescue and redeem? Yes, we want to see it. And the Lord says, love one another and I will put my blessing in that place. And my blessing, when I bless you, then you will see my kingdom come and my will will be done. What I require of you is not to be smarter. I require of you to love one another. Love one another. Love one another. But I don't like them. Love them. Love them. But God, they don't think like me. Love them. Love them for the glory of God. But God, they look different than me. Love them. It is a command from the hand of God. It's a command. Love them. Love them. As Christ has loved you, so you love your brothers and sisters. How did he love you? When you were dead and stinking and filthy and you didn't deserve anybody to love you. When you didn't deserve a single thing, the Lord made a way for you and said, I will love you and redeem you and rescue you. You've offered me nothing, I offer you everything. That is how the Lord God has loved us. How can we dare walk around and look and say, "Uh uh-uh, I don't love like that then you don't know the love of God that has rescued you from the darkness. Love one another. You want to see the power of God here? I do love each other. But pastor, isn't there more fancy spiritual things we can do? Not if you want the kingdom. Not if, if, you, want to, if you want to show, sure, have fun. I'm not going there though. I, I'm tired of that because you know what? For all of our show, our nation is not any more saved. Amen. Yeah, our nation, our nation is not being saved. For all of our information, our nation is not being saved. So it's going to take something different. Let's love each other. Love each other. They don't look like you. Love them. You don't look like God either, yet he loved you. Amen. He loved you. But God, Lord, I I don't know. They're, They're kind of messed up. You know what? You were kind of messed up and the Lord loved you. They don't offer me anything. You didn't offer the Lord anything. Love just like Jesus has loved you. You know what? When when we get a hold of that, that reality, that truth, and we are made confident that we are the loved sons and daughters of the Most High, when I get that He loves me, when I get it that He loves me, that He loves me, that He actually loves me, and when we get it as a family that He actually loves us, That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But it's more than that. For God so loved Ryan that he gave Jesus to die. For God so loved each and every one of you. Put your own name there. God loved you and he sent his son Jesus to die for you. In that same breath, now you turn around as a confident, loved child of God and say, you know what? I've got all the love that I need. You don't have to love me, but I'm going to love you. Come here, give me a hug in the name of Jesus. Most often we walk around as the insecure children of God. And we think that our love for others is supposed to be based on whether or not they can reciprocate. The Lord calls you to love for his glory. Why? Because he has first loved you. That's what the scripture says. Amen. Amen. Hey, join hands with the person on your right or left right now. And let's just seal these things for the glory of God in Christ Jesus. Father, in your mighty name, in your mighty name, we seal these things for your glory. Oh, hallelujah. Worthy are you, Lord. Make us one. Make us one. Make us one. Lord, we hear your, you, we hear your word. In John 13, would you put that scripture up there again for me? John 13. Thank you, Derek. I think that's you. Thank you. 
Jesus calls us loved ones as you're praying. The Lord says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. So we say, Lord, let it be. Let it be. Let it be. Let it be. Let us, let us come to the pinnacle of following Jesus. We love one another for the glory of God. We love one another for the glory of God. We love one another. We love one another. And Father, I pray and I thank you that as we continue to spend time in your presence that you're going to mark us with humility. And that humility you mark us with is going to bring a unity in this place because of the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. And as that unity works in this place, thank you that you're creating a community of believers where Jesus and the work of the cross is the centerpiece and the strength of what the Lord God is doing. And in that beautiful community, thank you for Psalm 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. It's like the anointing oil that ran down Aaron's beard and went onto his robe and ran down to the edges of his robe. For there the Lord commands a blessing, life forevermore. And I hear the Lord speaking over you today, church. I hear him saying, I give you life. I'm going to give you life. I'm going to bless you, church. I'm going to bless you, church, says the Lord. I'm going to bless you, church. As you walk in unity, I will bless you. As you walk in unity, I will rescue. As you walk in unity, I will redeem. As you walk in unity, I will rescue those family members you've been praying for. As you walk in unity, I will raise up those children that have left the house of God. As you walk in unity, I'm going <laughs> to spread my glory through you. As you walk in unity, the world will stand up and say, that is what we need for the glory of God. So let it be, let it be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Somebody say hallelujah.